Uh, thank you for being here this morning. It's good to see you. Um, I've had more than a couple of people approach me today, and they've been a little concerned uh, at how long we'd be preaching. <laughs> I guess my Wednesday night people have been uh, telling off on me. <laughs> so we've made a couple of uh, commitments already. I'm going to try to get you guys out of here in a, in a timely uh, fashion today. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to be looking in uh, the book of Ephesians, and we're going to take a really focused look at a couple of verses. Um, Ephesians 1, <clears throat> verses 15 through 19 is where we're going to be looking. Um, but before we do that, um, bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that uh, our worship today uh, is acceptable and, and glorifies you. And Lord, we pray that our time together uh, as your people um, will be fruitful. Speak to us through your word in a mighty way. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. <coughs> Uh, before we jump into verse 15, uh, I'd like us to read uh, beginning in verse 3 just to kind of get our minds focused and centered um, on Christ. And this is a, a fantastic passage for that. So in Ephesians, beginning in uh, chapter 1 and verse 3, read along with me um, in your Bible. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to to the good pleasure of his will. In verse 6, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth verse 11 in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So I guess if we had to summarize that, uh, the main idea that we should take away from all of that is that we've been given uh, an amazing gift. We've been saved by grace. We've been given um, an inheritance in Christ for all of eternity that we didn't do anything to deserve. Amen? Uh, sinners saved by grace, we've, we don't deserve uh, the grace that we've been given. Is basically what that says in a nutshell. Um, when we think about our salvation, when we think about uh, what we've been given along those lines um, it should give us great perspective on the everyday little problems and, and challenges that we face in our in our own lives amen uh, money problems uh, relationship problems uh, wh whatever it is that we face that's that sometimes these problems we we magnify 
and we Bear, can you turn off all the mics behind me except the lapel mic? Okay. Did that fix it? Yeah. All right. <coughs> so in other words, when we consider what we've been given, uh, how blessed we truly are, it should help us to, to not amplify or magnify these everyday issues that we face because in the grand scheme of things uh, we have all of eternity to look forward to with Christ um, in Romans 8 31 uh, through 39 it speaks to this uh, loudly Look what he says in verse 31 of Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So in other words, regardless of what happens today, regardless of what happens tomorrow, uh, whatever little minor inconveniences we actually face in our life, they pale in comparison to the riches of the inheritance that we've been given. Um, this life that we live here today and tomorrow um, is just a fraction of, of eternity. What we have to look forward to is, is all of eternity in perfection, right? Right? Uh, no problems. No, there will be no persecutions. No, there, there's no no problems. Uh, all of eternity with Christ, completely glorified and perfected. Uh, that's pretty awesome. That's uh, that should give us uh, great perspective in our lives. That should help us to endure uh, the things that we face on a day-to-day -day basis um, and deal with them in a in a godly way. Um, so having said that, with that kind of a, as the, the foundation for what we're going to talk about today, let's take a look back in Ephesians, uh, starting in verse 15. Okay, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Read along with me. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of of him, and here's where we really want to take a close look. Um, look what he says uh, going forward, verse 18: "The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe." So Paul deliberately calls out three specific things. 
to know what is the hope of his calling. Um, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us uh, who believe? So let's just take a look at the first one. Um, what is the hope of his calling? Have you ever thought about anything along those lines? Um, well, we all know what, what hope is, right? What is hope? We uh, eagerly anticipate um, things, right? That's, that's kind of what we, what we do when we hope. Uh, we're longing for or desiring a certain outcome or, or some, something to happen or to, to gain something. We hope for it. Uh, we don't generally hope for um, bad things or negative things. They're usually good things um, that we hope for or that we pray about. Um, I have great hope that the company that I work for um, will promote me soon. I have every reason to believe that um, I'm going to gain a promotion and that it's imminent. Um, I've, I've worked for two years uh, very hard. I've paid dues. Um, and I've taken advantage of every opportunity that's been given to me. So um, I'm, at a, I'm at a point where I'm ready to be promoted, and it's just an opportunity away. As soon as there's an opening, I, sh I should be the next guy up, and that's, that's great. I have a great hope um, about that. Um, my daughter hopes that I get promoted soon <laughs> so I can buy a new car because she hates riding in mine. <laughs> and my son hopes that I get promoted so I can buy a new car because he's going to get my old one. <laughs> so we all have hope for different things and have different motivations for our hope. Um, and just as I have a, a great hope about this, this imminent promotion, um, I do know and I have always this knowledge in, in the back of my mind that it, could not, it might not happen. I could get fired tomorrow. I could go in and, and handle a situation wrong in a moment of weakness. I could, uh, I could screw up or make a mistake, um, and I could lose my job. And it, not only not get promoted, but I could be fired. I could be out of work. That could happen. Um, we hope for all kinds of things in our life. I know that we all kind of share in that, uh, and they're, they're all different things. But when we hope for things... It's always with a, with a knowledge that the things that we hope for might not come to pass. They're not ironclad. They're not solidified. They're not a guarantee, right? What do you know of in your life that's a guarantee other than death? Taxes. If you don't pay taxes, the IRS, is, they're going to come talk to you, right? Um, but that's not the case with our salvation, according to Paul. Our hope in Christ is set in stone, right? If you belong to Christ, if you are, as Paul describes it in Ephesians, if you are one of God's elect, if you are his chosen, of his chosen people, um, your hope in Christ is completely solidified. Amen? So look what he says. That's why he says in, in this verse that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Um, his being God's and, and calling. Um, that's the key to the whole thing. Now that word calling is uh, in the Greek, kletos. And it means appointed. So um, it's, not, it's not a question. It's not uh, a petition. He's not asking. It's, it's a calling. Your, your salvation has been appointed to you, and it's rock solid. It's ironclad. Um, it's without question. Look what uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
starting in verse 8. Verse 8, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Um, I don't know how that hits you, but that, I mean, that is extremely powerful. Read it again. Verse 9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's pretty loud. That's pretty awesome. Um, called us with a holy calling. Um, that tells you that it's a unique calling. What does holy mean? Holy is completely unique. God is holy because there's nothing like him. He's completely unique. That's what the word means. And this calling that he's called you and he's called, we, he's called me with is a holy calling completely unique no calling like it because it's it's not a question it's a guarantee um, that's what that's what the text um, says John chapter 10 kind of drives this home a little further The Gospel of John, chapter 10. Jesus is um, in a conversation with some Pharisees. Um, and again, they're, they're trying to trip him up and uh, trying to catch him in, in a, what they would consider blasphemy. Um, but look what he says to him in verse 25. He says, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So that tells us that we are completely solidified in Christ. Um, if you've been saved, if you are uh, a child of God, if you are a part of the church, um, there's nothing that you can ever do or say. There's no sin that you can commit that can cause you to lose your salvation. You're solidified. It's rock solid. It's, it's not up to you to maintain a certain level. It's not up to you to maintain a certain degree of righteousness. It's not up to you to keep the law or to hold the law. You're solidified in Christ because God has appointed you to Christ. Amen. It can't be lost. So I think that's what Paul is driving at when he asks the question or when he makes the statement. It's a part of his prayer for these people uh, in this church in Ephesus. Um, he's praying that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened and that they may know what is the hope of his calling. That they understand fully 
exactly what God has done for them and who they are and what they have to look forward to. <clears throat> he continues on, and with the next thing, he says, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And in verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Those, the two next things, uh, the riches of his glory, glorious inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power are pretty much intertwined. Um, he continues on uh, in verse 20. Um, in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? In verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. So the, ex the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Uh, what does that say to us? It tells us that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and well in you and in me. The exact same power. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is in you. That's pretty. That's an awe-inspiring thing. Um, we don't think about that too often because many times we feel pretty weak as humans. We feel pretty incapable um, at times at dealing with certain things. But the fact of the matter is, and what Paul is speaking to us, is that um, he, he wants us to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And it's the same power that rose Christ from the grave. It's the same power that Jesus used to bring Lazarus back to life. Right? Jump over uh, to the third chapter uh, of Ephesians, beginning in verse 14. And look what he says here. For the reason, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That makes it pretty clear that we, as redeemed people, as born-again Christians, aren't weak and unaffected. Uh, we do have every reason for hope, and we were completely empowered by the gospel to live out a life worthy of God. That's what the scriptures um, tell us but it's interesting um, in 2016 um, we were witnessing kind of a, a phenomenon um, it's really more of a crisis in Christianity um, what we see on one hand is a, a growing 
complacency, um, a growing tolerance for sin. We, as the church, become more and more and more complacent in our sin, more and more and more willing to turn a blind eye to the sin that, that lives in our lives, that's present in our lives, that's present in our brothers and sisters' lives. Um, we don't want to look at it because if we look at their sin, then we've got to look at our sin, and we don't want to do that. Um, so while on one hand we've got this complacency with sin, and you hear it on the radio, you hear it in the songs, um, and not, I'm not talking about the worldly songs, I'm talking about the songs, I'm, the so-called Christian songs. Listen to the lyrics sometimes. We're more and more and more complacent with sin. And on the other hand, we have a growing um, there's a growing trend in, in Christianity that places a great deal of emphasis on spiritual gifts, if you will, or faith healings. Um, there's a tongues movement. Um, all these types of things are becoming more and more and more popular on one hand. And on the other hand, we've got this complacency with sin. And those two things just don't seem to add up in my mind uh, or in Scripture, more importantly. So what we're being led to believe is that uh, God's given us power to heal people, to place our hands on people and, and uh, do perform miracles in the name of Jesus Christ is what we're being told. And on one hand, we don't have the power to overcome the sin in our lives. Does that make sense? It doesn't to me. Um, in the New Testament, we see, um, I don't know, how, how many letters are there in the New Testament? 20, 27? 27 epistles written to churches in the New Testament, whether by Paul um, or Peter. Um, and I challenge you, in, in any of those letters, you'll never find, you won't find, you don't find, there isn't any instruction to heal anybody. There's no instruction to speak in tongues or to do any of these showy things. You don't find it. It's not there. And that's exactly what those letters are to the churches, right? Those are instructional letters meant to be instructional for the church. Paul wrote them. Peter wrote them so that we might know how to be the church, right? You guys with me? Um, but you don't find anywhere in, in those letters any instruction to do any of those things. But what you do see is a consensus and a consistent teaching, whether it's in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Romans, any letter, you, you open one up, and what you do find is instruction. Um, to be God's people, to live a life that's worthy of the calling to which you were called. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what we're to do. <clears throat> Back in Ephesians, Chapter 4, look what Paul says in verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Turn 
turn to Colossians uh, chapter 1. You're going to see something similar. Colossians 1, I'm beginning in verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins. These letters that we know to be instructional, we use them for instruction. Uh, We look to them often for instruction. They were written to a specific people, a specific church. Uh, This one was written to the church in, uh, of the Colossians. Um, but look what he says in uh, chapter 4. Um, in chapter 4, verse 16, at the very end, he says, Now when this pi- epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from the Laodicea, um, and you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Um, these epistles were written to specific churches for a specific person, but they were to be shared among all the churches, just as we share them today, to learn from them, to be strengthened, and for our understanding to be um, enlightened. Um, and I've just got one more for you, uh, and we'll close. And it's in First Peter chapter 1. And this does a great job at, at kind of summing everything up, uh, and really it, it should charge us um, and unify our minds and put us on the track and set our minds to what it should be set on. Look what he says, beginning in verse 13. He says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace of that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So he doesn't say be holy and be set apart and be the light at church. He doesn't say put on your smiling face and show up Sunday morning and greet everybody and shake hands and and everything's great. He doesn't say to do that. Um, He says be holy in all of your conduct. That means in every walk of life. That means when you're at work. That means I'm going to step on some toes. That means when you're at the ball game and things aren't going the way that you like um, or that when the, the referee or the umpire makes a bad call, well, we love to get on those guys. And we love, as Christians, I've seen it and I've done it, but we are relentless at ball games to officials. 
Anybody, can anybody relate to that or am I the only one? <laughs> and I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm only saying what once was, was said. It says, be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And remember what that word holy means. It means unique and set apart and like no other. And we, sh we should be unique and set apart and like no other. He continues on in verse 17 and says, And if you call on the Father who is without partiality, judges accordingly to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So read that again. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here. He's talking about your short little life here on earth. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. I told you I was going to be short today. I'm going to keep my promise. Um, we'll close there. Uh, let's pray.